Okay, so the last major co topic that we will cover in phase equilibrium is liquid-liquid equilibrium. So, it is a equilibrium problem in thermodynamics, so what is our starting point? Partial fugacities. In this case, we don't have two, a liquid and a vapor phase, so we have two liquid phases, so typically we'll just say the partial fugacity of species I in phase one, and in this case we know that that's liquid phase one, has to be equal to the partial fugacity of the liquid in phase two. Now this applies for every single component in the system. So if we have a binary system, like an oil or water system, or organic and water system, we have this relationship for both the water component and the, and the, and the organic component. Now this is in addition to what we already know, that the pressures have to be equal and that the temperatures have to be equal. So with these three expressions, right, this is our basis for all of our phase equilibrium for any type of mixture at all. We have our chemical equilibrium, our mechanical equilibrium, there's no movement, no pressure differentials, no force changes, and our thermal equilibrium. <clears throat> so, for a liquid, we can write the partial fugacity in the following form. Right, and to a large extent, this is strictly a definition because we are relying on the activity coefficient. And recall that the activity coefficient, uh, let's see, get this right here. The activity coefficient is defined based on the excess partial Gibbs free energy which, as we know, is related to the partial fugacity. To, to some extent, from a strictly conceptual perspective, this is very cyclic logic. Right? But it should be no different than the concept that we all, accept, all accept that we have to use C sub P's to calculate delta H's, for example. Right? And the exact same notion that classical thermo has no methodology to predict the properties of a fluid. We just have to jump in at some point and say, okay, what do we need to measure experimentally in the lab to help us solve this problem? And for this particular scenario in liquid-liquid equilibrium, we have to jump in and develop some sort of a strategy to calculate the activity coefficient. Right? And we do that through the Gibbs free energy of the system. <coughs> and typically, in practical terms, we do that based on liquid vapor equilibrium. So if we have a liquid-liquid system, you heat it up to its bubble point, you can measure its vapor-liquid equilibrium properties, and from there, you can sort of back figure out how the two liquid phases are behaving. And that's ultimately how we gain this information to do these types of experiments, or, or these types of calculations. But it should feel no different than the fact that we have to rely on C sub P, C sub V, delta H of vaporization measurements, uh, vapor pressure measurements, right? These are all things that we physically have to measure because classical thermo doesn't tell us about the actual properties of the fluids. It tells us how we can manipulate the properties in different ways. Stat mech can tell us about how we can actually predict the properties based on the bonding, the interactions, and so on and so forth, right? So stat mech is really an evolution of classical thermo to actually give it more predictive power. And then now the modern age is a computer simulation or a molecular simulation. Instead of doing stat mech, which is a pen and paper form, of basically saying, these are how atoms behave, this is what the properties of a collective amount of atoms are. Now we'll say, okay, instead of doing that uh, arithmetically through stat mech, we'll do it on a computer and have the computer do the calculations and use numerical methods. Question? A couple of weeks ago you were saying that uh, the statistical mechanics, like the, the modern the modern way of doing it, is like really good for like really complex systems, right? But like if you have like a simple system, like an ideal like 
Uh, so if you if you if an equation of state works, it's way easier. But one of the main concerns where you'd want to use a molecular simulation versus something, let's say, like uh, an equation of state, uh, <clears throat> depends on the properties that you're interested in. So uh, in our research group, we do a lot of self-assembly type work. So if I wanted to know, let's say, how these molecules interacted, right? So if I had two molecules that stuck together like this versus stuck together like this, which is not very helpful in the video, right? That's going to change the properties. So for example, if you're building an organic electronic device, you want to have the electrons be able to transmit through conducting polymers. They don't transmit well if the molecules are oriented like this, but they are oriented well if the molecules are like this. So a molecular simulation will give you information on the molecular scale of how things are organized. A, an equation of state will only give you bulk macroscopic properties. It doesn't give you any microscopic properties. So it'll tell you maybe what the boiling point is or what the freezing point is or something like that, but it won't actually give you all the information that you may or may not need to design your particular system. <clears throat> um, okay, so with this information, uh, we can substitute our definition for liquid fugacity, or rather our approximation for liquid fugacity, into our governing phase equilibrium expression for liquid-liquid equilibrium. And so what we find is that for every expression, for every compound, right, which is called species I, but it could be A, B, C, D, or component 1, 2, 3, 4, we set these terms equal. Now, just as a reminder, the activity coefficient is a function of temperature, pressure, and composition. Right, so in this case, the activity coefficient for species I in phase one is dependent on the composition of phase one, whereas the fugacity of species I is only equal to the temperature and pressure of the system, right? Because there's no overbar, so this is the pure fluid properties. Likewise, for the activity coefficient on the right-hand side, again, it's a function of temperature, pressure, and the composition of the second phase. So how can we simplify this expression? So what cancels out? Yep, pure species fugacities cancel out. So what we're left with for the liquid-liquid governing equation is this expression here. Now notice, right, that we have the superscript, right, 1, or pi in numerals, whatever you want to think about it, right? That's typically saying, so we denote the phases as phase 1 and phase 2. What you call phase 1 and what you call phase 2, doesn't matter. So in practical terms, if you have in the case of, let's say, the homework we did, uh, ethanol and cyclohexane, right? If you cool that down to a low enough temperature, eventually they're going to phase separate out, right? So in that circumstance, you would have phase one could be what we would call maybe the ethanol-rich phase, and phase two could be the cyclohexane-rich phase. Mathematically speaking, it's not a whole lot of fun to write cyclohexane-rich phase, right? So we just say phase one. But in the same way, like in energy balances at the start of class, I don't care if you have positive work or negative work. Just tell me, is it going into the system or out of the system? So when you're reporting your answers for a liquid-liquid equilibrium problem, I want to know, is phase one the ethanol-rich phase or the cyclohexane-rich phase? Right? Whichever component is enriched in that, we'll call that the rich phase. So maybe it's a water-rich phase and an oil-rich phase. Right, so that, that's the terminology. But mathematically, we'll just write you know, phase one and phase two because it's a lot easier than scribbling out a much more elaborate thing. Okay, But the thing to keep in mind here is that these activity coefficients, they're going to have the same model for an activity coefficient model, but you're going to have different compositions that you put into those models, which is going to vary significantly. So if we look at an example, in this case is the simplest example, 
right, again, we have the activity coefficient is defined based on the partial excess Gibbs free energy. So this term, the partial excess Gibbs here, this is the deviation from ideal mixing in the Gibbs free energy that is attributable to species one. So we have a lot of different conditionals built on there. But recall, all of this goes back to just satisfying the first and second laws of thermo. But we have these definitions to make things more simple. Well, attempt to make it more simple. Uh, <clears throat> so if we say that we're using the one constant Margulis expression, uh, let me replace these i's with one to make it better. Uh, x2. Great. Right, the one constant Margulis uh, equilibrium coefficient model. One. We have that the activity coefficient of species one is based on the amount of species two in the system and also this coefficient A. So if we rearrange the expression, we have the activity coefficient is given by that expression. When we substitute that into our liquid-liquid governing equation, we can see the true complexity of liquid-liquid equilibrium. And this expression that I'm writing here is actually only valid for a binary system, right? Because I've substituted this uh, uh, one, so this is x of, I don't know, let's say, i plus x of j plus i equals one, basically, right? If you had a multi-component, like a three-component system, it wouldn't be as simple as this. You would have to actually, you'd have to have a more advanced uh, activity coefficient model. Even the simplest liquid-liquid equilibrium problems are nonlinear expressions that require nonlinear solvers. So back in the old days, you had to use guess and check approximation methods. Nowadays, we can use a nonlinear solver in Excel or MATLAB or even in your calculator. But this is the simplest way that we can write a liquid-liquid expression with the one constant Margulis model, which is not typically going to be very accurate. It's, a very, it's symmetric. So unless your system, if your system is not symmetric, you have to use a two component model. And so in this case, your liquid liquid expression just becomes more and more complicated, the more and more advanced of a model that you particularly choose. So because it's so non-ideal, we can get basically the full run of possibilities and options as to what a liquid liquid system will behave like. So there's a lot of properties that, that are associated with liquid-liquid equilibrium. Okay. So <clears throat> at equilibrium, we have a minimum Gibbs free energy with a constant TP system. Right? And this is based strictly on maximizing entropy. If you maximize entropy, you minimize Gibbs free energy. So for a constant pressure temperature system, which for us is the easiest to control, just put in a constant temperature bath and do it you know, in an open system and you have a constant temperature and pressure. So all the experiments that we will typically like to do for us will follow this criteria. So we can write the Gibbs free energy of an ideal mixture, right, G under bar for the total mixture, is gonna be equal to a effectively weighted average of the Gibbs free energy of the pure species, right? This is how much 
every component in the system contributes to the mixture. Right? It's going to have a certain Gibbs free energy, which means it has a certain enthalpy and a certain entropy. And when you mix them together, that's how much it initially contributes. Then we are going to add in the effect of mixing on entropy. <clears throat> Another way that we can write this then is that the Gibbs free energy of mixing right, is just how much entropy we gain from entropy. Because we're calling an ideal mixture, there's no enthalpy of mixing. Right? But no matter what, even for an ideal gas, the simplest system, when you mix two things together, you're effectively giving both components more volume. If you give it more volume, there's more, move, more room for it to move around, and it gains entropy in the process. So if we are to just quickly remind ourselves what uh, the natural log function looks like, right? for any mole fraction less than 1, the natural log, so the natural log of xi is less than 0 for xi less than 1, which means that this contribution here is always negative. Without, without non-ideality, everything would mix with everything. So for example, if I were to pour you know, water on the table, if everything behaved ideally, it would just dissolve. Right? It would mix together, and everything would melt and fall into the ocean. So all of our world is interesting because of non-idealities. If everything behaved ideally, everything would mix into everything else. <clears throat> so for a non-ideal system, the total Gibbs free energy, G under bar, right, which again is going to be a function of temperature, pressure, and composition of the system, is again going to be equal to how much each species brings to the mixture. Right, in this case, on the left-hand side, the G underbar has no subscript. That's how we know it's for the total system. On this side here, it has a subscript I, denoting that it is for species I. The underbar tells us it's for the pure species. The overbar would tell us how it behaves in a mixture, the partial species, the partial property. <clears throat> we have the ideal contribution of entropy to mixing, and we have an additional contribution for the non-ideality, right? the total excess Gibbs free energy of the mixture. Again, if we use the one constant Margulis, simple way that we can slap on the excess Gibbs. So there are two ways to make this mixture behave ideally. If x2 goes to 0, then the activity coefficient goes to 1 means that as you have a fluid that is basically surrounded by itself, it doesn't know that it's in a mixture, it behaves ideally. If the, 
coefficient a goes to zero, again, it behaves ideally, activity coefficient goes to one. So what we're going to be spending a lot of time now is looking at graphs of liquid-liquid systems to sort of get a feel for how they behave. So I'll draw it out nice and big. So what we're essentially doing is plotting the equation that I just drew for a binary system. And we are looking at the total Gibbs free energy of the system as it's mixed, which again is a function of temperature, pressure, and composition. So on the x-axis we have drawn the mole fraction of species 1 in the mixture, and this is the total mixture. So all the way on the far right hand side, this would be the Gibbs free energy of pure 1, and all the way on the left hand side we would have the Gibbs free energy of pure species 2. For any particular total composition of the system, we're having a little bit of component 1, a little bit of component 2, so the total amount of Gibbs free energy that you put into this jar is going to be a average or a straight line connecting these two. That's the initial point. That's how much you're adding to the system. So if I added a 50-50 mixture, you know I would be somewhere in the middle. Right, there's two separate jars, but if I added together the Gibbs, that's how much I'd start off with. As soon as I mix them, then we initiate all the non-ideal systems. So if we were to have a system where A is equal to zero, in this case here, A is equal to zero, we can see here that no matter what composition Right, no matter what composition along this line that we make, the Gibbs free energy will always decrease. So there's no problem at all. You mix them together, the entropy that is generated as a result of mixing will lower the Gibbs free energy and everything is perfectly miscible. There is no mixture here where the Gibbs free energy has to go up always miscible. Everything is infinitely miscible. Gibbs free energy is always lowered. As we increase our A, it starts to be less and less negative. All of this non-ideal behavior is coming from the ideal entropy of mixing. Now if we reach a certain point, we find ourselves in a situation where we've got some, some interesting non-ideal behaviors. I believe I'm actually plotting out A over RT here. So at around a over RT is equal to about 3. This is where we start to see phase separation occurring in a one constant Margulis expression. So what we find is that we have curvature in the Gibbs free energy plot and we also have some sort of minima, not necessarily a full dip. So for example, if we were to make up mixtures here and about there, we would see that we would be lowering our composition, or lowering our Gibbs free energy, if we were to have our system split into two phases. And the way that we figure out what the composition of these two phases are is that we end up drawing a tie line that tangentially connects these minima points. So if I were to make up a 50-50 mixture at some point in the middle here, my Gibbs free energy would be there. 
if it were a pure phase. But that's not the minimum Gibbs that are possible. So instead, we will form two separate liquid phases at these compositions here and these compositions here, connected by this tie line. So we'll go over this again a couple times to make it a little bit clear. So then if we had to draw it out, I could say that this is the mole fraction of component one in phase one, and then over here would be the mole fraction of component one in phase two. Then of course, x2 of phase one is equal to x1, sorry, one minus x1 phase one, and the same thing for phase two. Right? So this graph here is only telling us it about component one in the system. Okay, so let's do this again, but we'll clean it up and exaggerate it a bit. For a system that potentially really hates each other. Okay. Again, we have X1. We're looking at the total Gibbs free energy of the system. Gibbs of 2, Gibbs of 1. And we have a dashed line connecting them. And this time we'll draw it really exaggerated. Okay. So, a couple of features to note here. Firstly, the phase equilibrium tells us how these two things split is based on drawing a tie line, uh, should be straight, connecting two tangential points of this Gibbs free energy curve. So that would tell us that our two compositions are here and about, if I drew it well, maybe about here. It is not, however, at the minima points in these curves. And we can illustrate that by looking at how much the Gibbs free energy drops as a result of mixing. Because if we look at how much the Gibbs free energy drops here and here at the minima in the, in the curve, it's actually shorter than the lines there. So the green lines are longer than the blue. So what's throwing us off a little bit is how everything's kind of skewed and tilted up. But the phase equilibrium minimums are at these two points. So you could, in theory, solve liquid-liquid problems graphically if you have an activity coefficient model and you write it out like this. But I think it's clear enough, especially on this one over here, we can see that this green line is longer than the blue line here. Okay. <clears throat> So a couple of things to recall. If we recall, for the universe to be stable, what is the curvature of entropy? Negative. Negative, right? Any perturbation of the system has to make it so that the entropy kind of starts to level off. So d squared s always has to be less than 0, so that the entropy kind of always will level off to a particular point. If it were the opposite case, and entropy were to increase like this and be convex, any small change in the universe would result in the entropy increasing, and then another change on that would result in the entropy increasing, and then everything would basically explode and fall apart. All right, so entropy has to be concave. Likewise, that means that the Gibbs free energy has to be convex. So for a fluid to be stable, rather anything in the universe to be stable, the Gibbs free energy has to be convex. It has to curve up or has to smile. I always think of it as smiling and frowning. What that tells us then is that we have some interesting inflection points here. If I can draw them well. So at about here, we have d squared g is equal to 0, right? By calculus, that gives us an inflection point. And at about here, we have d squared g is equal to 
zero. So in this region, we have concave Gibbs free energy. This is unstable. In this region here, we have the Gibbs free energy is convex. It is a stable fluid. Same thing over here. Now one additional area, let me see if I can, I'm running out of colors here. So these areas in red, these are stable regions. But these are the regions of one phase. So if I were to mix up a total fluid composition anywhere in this region here, I would be lowering my Gibbs free energy no matter what. Right? There's no point where the Gibbs free energy goes up. So these two fluids are miscible. So until I cross that green line, I haven't hit my phase boundary and I'm fully miscible. Same thing on the right hand side as well. As soon as I hit the green line, then I will be able to minimize the Gibbs free energy if I split into two different phases. Not trivial to see here, but mathematically it'll all work out. But there's something very interesting about the curvature in these stable regions where the Gibbs free energy is uh, uh, smiling up, convex, right? And it has to do with sort of different types of precipitation mechanisms. But what I'd like to define here, if I can choose a color that will stand out, I don't know if I can, is write down, this is the, the nodal region, and the binodal region is the phase equilibrium or the coexistence region, right? This is the composition that the two phases want to separate into when you have equilibrium. And in the middle, we have the spinodal region, right, that is bound by these regions of instability. So binodal is the phase boundary or the coexistence curve. Spinodal is the region of instability. Okay, let's jot that down before we start with a new graph and clean it up a little bit. Okay, so what we're going to look at now is a phase diagram for a liquid liquid system. Right, that, that curve that we looked at as a function of mixture properties, it's very nice conceptually to sort of visualize what's going on, but in terms of giving us a lot of information in a compact form, not particularly useful. Right? You'd have to have a different curve for every single temperature. So if we look at a phase diagram for a liquid-liquid system, what we're really interested in is you know, typically pressures aren't going to affect liquid properties too much. So we really we care about the temperature. So we want to know at what conditions do we phase separate and what temperature and, and what are the properties of the liquids of that phase separation? So typically a phase diagram for a liquid-liquid system is going to look something like this. This outside curve is the binodal. This inside curve is the spinodal. This top point right here is what they call the upper consulate temperature. You can also have a 
lower consulate temperature. In the region between the binodal and the spinodal, you have a stable fluid. Right? It may want to phase separate, but actually there's nothing critically wrong with it necessarily. In an ideal world, it'll phase separate, right? But there's going to be kinetic barriers to get that to happen. In the middle region in here, this is where we have an unstable fluid. Up here, we have one phase. Right, some liquids can phase separate as you heat them up. Some liquids can. Uh, so there's a lot of crazy behaviors, especially when you do with polymer, polymer systems. But in general, conceptually, we think if we heat things up, they'll become more miscible, right? Because the, you'll have more energy so they can overcome that delta H of mixing. So very often, if you grab a paper that's talking about a polymer system or a liquid system or any equilibrium system, they'll refer to these terms binodal and spinodal, right? Binodal is this curve that basically tells us what our two-phase region is. So if we read this exactly like we were to read a TXY diagram, if we make a liquid mixture at a particular composition, right, at a particular temperature, it's going to phase separate into phase one. So this would be x of one of phase one and x of one of phase two. And I could switch phase one and phase two, it doesn't matter. And we have a chain rule, or sorry, a lever rule that tells us how much of each of the two phases we have. Exact same rules, right? So the more of phase one we have, the more that this dot will get pulled that way. The more of phase two we have, the more the dot will get pulled that way. That's the way I like to think of the lever rule. It's like a tug of war game. So these phase diagrams are much more useful for us as an engineer to design around. Because now we have a function of temperature and a function of composition, and we can figure out how much of each of the two phases we have. But what I'd like to talk about a bit is what's going on in the binodal and the spinodal region. Okay, so if we try and find a color that works, if we start off with a system at a particular composition, at a particular temperature, where that temperature is above the upper consulate temperature, and we quench it, we drop its temperature, to two scenarios. One, we cross the binodal curve, and we go to condition A, or we keep on cooling it, and we go into condition B, which is in the spinodal region. What we've effectively done is made two systems, one of them where we go into this region here where we form a two-phase system, but we form a two-phase system in a region where the fluid is fundamentally stable. And another one where we go and form a two-phase system where the fluid is fundamentally unstable. One has a curvature going down, one has a curvature going up. You have markedly different characteristics and properties. So, we have to do a little bit of sort of, a, a sort of a mathematics in a strictly math sense, which generally for engineers it's a scary prospect. So this has to go into the definition of what a convex and concave function are. If we have a system here where, let's, let's look at condition B first. We're going into the spinodal region. We are in a condition where the Gibbs free energy is concave. And what we're going to imagine is that we have a mixture, right? We've poured these two fluids together and we've got a beaker. But at some point, some molecule is going to twist or rotate or move, and you're going to be able to sort of draw a circle around two different regions. All right, so we're starting off with some well-mixed system. Instantly, magically, we well-mix it. And then it's going to split off into two slightly different systems. 
I'm going to say we're breaking it apart there, right? We're going to break it off into, you know, some sort of little micro state one and some little micro state two. I right? just imagine that these molecules may be twisted or shifted or changed, whatever, some small, small amount. If the function is concave like this, the change in the function, or in this case the Gibbs free energy that we're looking at, as it splits into two small little deviations, some delta G1 and some delta G2. The delta G of this process, let me just get rid of this underbar, is going to be equal to delta G1 plus delta G2. What is essentially happening here is that when we split into these two different little microstates, we'll notice that the total Gibbs free energy of the system, if I add them together, is fundamentally lowered. And that's essentially basically the definition of what a convex, sorry, concave function is. Now it's accentuated because I drew it at the maximum, but you could really apply this concept to any point on this curve. It doesn't look it necessarily, but if you were to add these two points together, it would be lower than your initial starting point. So at any point along the curve, if your function satisfies this relationship here where this is smaller, right, it decreases, you have a convex function. Sorry, concave function, frowning function. So what this tells us is that if we are in the unstable region, there is no possible change in the fluid, regardless of how insignificant it seems, that results in a, everything will lower the Gibbs free energy. Absolutely everything. So every single molecular motion, molecular vibration, little twitch, little shove, little breeze that goes through, everything lowers the Gibbs free energy. And that causes a different form of phase transition called spin-odal decomposition, uh, where I will show a video for that in just a second. Uh, but conceptually, what that means is that as we go from time t equals zero, where we boom, we quench it down into the spinodal region, the molecules of those two phases will try and separate as quickly as humanly possible in a diffusion-limited manner. They will run for the hills and run away from one another. And so what ends up happening is that you will form these sort of striation-like patterns, which is very characteristic of a spinodal decomposition, and that they will then ripen into large interconnected regions. And this is a type of phase transition called spinodal decomposition. And that is a direct consequence of quenching a multi-component system into an unstable region of the Gibbs free energy. This is not what we commonly see in our day-to-day -day lives. What we commonly see when we think of a phase transition is based on phase separation of a stable fluid, right, where we have a convex Gibbs free energy. Right, and in this case here, if we split into two little different microstates, right, we see that the Gibbs free energy increases. So the Gibbs of the final split system, right, which is delta G1 plus delta G2, this is greater than our initial starting point. Now I've drawn it accentuated here at the minimum, but it applies for every point along the way in a convex function. And in this situation, where D squared G is greater than zero, we have nucleation as our primary phase separation mechanism. This is exactly the same concept as when we were dealing with small systems and the effect of surface tension. In order for a small bubble to grow large 
and form its own second phase, it has to overcome surface tension. And so there's a possibility to supersaturate either with respect to temperature or with respect to composition. Right? In a liquid-liquid system, we're typically going to think of supersaturation with respect to composition. Right? So just in the same way, for example, there you can do these cool little experiments where you like put in a ton of sugar, right? but you cool it down so slowly that there's no nucleating sites. But as soon as you flick in a little uh, crystal, the whole thing solidifies. Right? That's a supersaturation condition. So what you know you've done in that case is you've made a solution that is in the stable binodal region. As soon as you change the composition enough that you cross that spinodal line, you have no control and it'll instantly change phases, or near instantly change. But in the case of where you do that experiment, you flick in a little flake of a crystal, what you've done is you've overcome that nucleation energy barrier, and then you can then form a second phase. So in this case here, the phase separation at time t equals zero, you have a single pure phase at some delta t, you'll form some small bubble that will then grow into a larger bubble. So it's a fundamentally different way that phase transitions happen. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to switch over and watch a couple of videos on YouTube really quick. Uh, the first one is of boiling water. Right, so, so we'll talk about nucleation of boiling water, then we'll show some spinal decomposition ones. Uh, any questions before I wrap up sort of the theoretical content, and we can go to watch some videos before we finish for the day. Okay, so I'll end the lecture. <laughs>